feel it? Isn't that awesome? Now, if you need anything right now in your body, your mind, your finances, your marriage, just take a deep breath and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I receive it. I receive it. I believe it. I receive it. You did it all for me on the cross of Calvary. It is finished. It is mine for all times. I belong to you. Say that. And I am a vessel in your hands. I'm a chisel to chisel at this world. I have the fire of God to burn up shaft and wickedness everywhere I go. I am royalty. And I am filled with dynamite power. Let it flow through me like fiery rivers, like a volcano that erupts with flames of fire and lava flowing from me everywhere I go and touching lives with the love of Jesus. Use me, Holy Spirit, to see notable miracles, to see arms grow out, mental wards emptied out, hospitals empty out, that sinners repent, people of alternate lifestyles change, that you will use me in the power of the supernatural, which will be natural in me from this day forward. I will never be the same because of you. I know the power of your name, and I will exalt you in every name that is on planet Earth will bow its knee to the name of Jesus. And therefore, I will declare and decree everywhere I go that you be lifted up in Jesus' name. Now we're going to sing a song. The Holy Spirit just put this on me. And I'm not a singer. So anyway, here goes. And you all know it. Alleluia. 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 Let's just worship him. He's worthy. Alleluia. He is worthy. Highest praise. Alleluia. Alleluia. Ah. Now change it to, you are my Lord. You are my Lord. You're 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 my Lord. Go back to Alleluia. Alleluia. Isn't God good? I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out. I want to thank most of all Jesus for showing up. I want to thank Pastor for inviting me to come back to your area. And I think that I'm in covenant relationship with this church. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that as a cliche. I am not in relationship with most of the churches that I go to. I mean, I'm in, you know, fellowship. But there's a difference when it becomes a covenant relationship. There's something different about this church 
and I haven't put my finger on it yet, but there is something different. And I love this church, and I love your pastors, and they are sweethearts. Yeah, I almost feel like they could be my kids. In fact, they probably could be my kids because they're probably about the same age as my. How old are you, by the way? Oh, yeah. See, my children are all over 50, so <laughs> no problem. All right. So I'm, I'm going to share with you some secrets, nuggets. Now, there's nothing today that is, is profound, okay? And I asked the Lord one time, so I'm going to be honest with all of you. I said, Lord, why do I preach such simple messages? And why do you keep having me preach these simple messages? And how come you keep having me preach a lot of the same messages? And no matter what I preach, it kind of comes out the same, even though they're different messages. I mean, it, and I said, I don't understand this, God. And he says, because the pipe that you are, whatever comes through this pipe is going to come out with a flavor of evangelism, because that's what you are. He says, so if you're a teacher, then the teacher, that flavor will come out. And if you're a prophet, it's, but you, so you flow. And then I said, well, one, somebody said one time, you're a prophet. And I said, no, I'm not a prophet. And they go, yeah, you are a prophet. I said, no, because we got to know the difference between a prophet and somebody that prophesies. And so what God does, and this is part of your training, is God's going to use you in the gifts severally as he wills. Because you, you think, I used to hear people say, I have this gift, and I have this gift. I have a gift of healing. I have this gift. I have that, this. I said, no, you don't. You got it wrong. You don't have anything. He has you. And God's Holy Spirit will use you how he wants to use you, where he wants to use you, with what gift he wants to use you. So let me give you an example. If somebody's in your meeting and you don't really have a, a healing ministry, like people say, oh, it's a healing ministry or a deliverance ministry. No, no, it's just ministry. And so God wants to use all of us in every single gift of ministry that's available, severally as he wants and he gives you the tools, because there's a toolbox in his 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There's a toolbox. There's nine different gifts. And God will pull out the tool he wants when he wants. So let me give you an example right now. Let's say that we're working on a car. So if we're working on a car, so you guys know better, okay, than us women. Okay, um, if you're working on a car... I told you one time, I think I said it here, is the best way to get a flat tire fixed, if you get a flat tire, is stand out there with your flat tire with the screwdriver. <laughs> because the men driving by go, oh my God, look at that lady. She thinks she's going to do something with that screwdriver, and they pull over and change your tire for you. So, okay, so what I'm saying is there's different gifts, but... If you're going to change a tire, you need a monkey wrench and whatever. I don't know what else you need for what a tire. Well, that's not a good example. But let's say you're going to build a house. You're going to need, give me some tools. Hammer, saw, nails. Huh? Yeah, nail gun. Okay, so you got it. So there's certain things you're going to need to build a house. Let's say we're going to cook a cake. Okay, ladies, all guys. Come on. Flour. Yeah, no, let's, the tools. What? Measuring spoons. How about pans? A mixer? Okay, an oven. Oh, that's a good one. Okay. So what I'm saying is, you're going to use certain tools for certain things, and God wants to have us prepared vessels that whatever tool of the Holy Spirit. So when we're out doing the supernatural, God wants us to always have our toolbox with all nine gifts of the Spirit and have them sharp. So you do, do, tools don't go dull. So how do you keep them sharp? And I talked a little bit about it last night, praying in tongues, staying in the Word. And the other key of walking in the supernatural is you will never see the supernatural operating in you because you can have all the tools because it's not your tools, it's the Holy Spirit in you, okay? Those are his tools, and he's given you the ability to flow in those tools as he desires. You follow? 
then we know that God wants to use all of us. We shared that last night in our teaching that the Holy Spirit's going to work through you with intercession, that God's perfect will will be accomplished and nothing can stop God's will in your life, and that you have Jesus at the right hand always praying in intercession for you. So we know that God's complete here. In, in John 17, we know that God's word says that we be one as the Father is. He said that the glory... Let me finish it. So if you read John 17, and I'm not going to go into the whole thing right now. I'm just doing a little recap of last night. So when you're one in Christ and the Holy Spirit's in you, then just like Jesus, everything he did was by the unction of the Holy Spirit, how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit who went about doing good and healing all the oppressed of the devil. Well, Jesus didn't do anything except the Holy Spirit told him to. Now, it's not a different Holy Spirit that's in you or a different Holy Spirit that's in a five-year-old. Because in our tent meetings, we've had five and six-year-olds come up. I've lined them up and had them pray for all the sick. And they, they would start praying for people, and they'd fall out under the power of God. And the little five and six-year-olds were looking at each other going, did you feel that? Yeah, what was that? That was something that, and they, did, they were in awe. And, and so God has like, oh, you know, some people say, well, there's a revival with the youth. I go, great. You see, this last move of God, just so you all know, it's going to be done from the littlest child to the oldest, oldest person in the world. Because God's going to call it, cut it short in righteousness, and he's going to use everybody. Now, you have a choice. You can either be part of this great army, or you can refuse to be this great army based on what you do now. You need to be prepared the word of the Lord last night was, we're the bride getting ready for Jesus' return. Amen. And that we will have a church that's white without spot, without wrinkle. So God's going to use us. So we need to step forward into these gifts and calling. But the third thing I want to share, so we know that we're one with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We know that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are praying for us. But you're not going to do anything if you don't activate it. You can have all this right know-how. Just then when I do my school on uh, Let's Go Fishing, in my Let's Go Fishing book, which is the first, one of the first books that I wrote, it shows a picture in that book of a fishing uh, a bathtub. All right? And I tell people this. You could go to the best school to learn how to fish. You can get the best Michelin poles. And you can have the best poles, and you can make your own fly, whatever they are, um, and go fishing. And you can have all this knowledge, but if you put that fishing pole in a bathtub with all of your knowledge, and you stick it in the bathtub, you can fish till you're blue in the face, and you're not going to catch one fish because there's no fish there. So if you're going to walk in the supernatural, you have to, you have to activate it. Now, there's two ways to activate it. One is in the spirit realm, which is the best way, but then the flesh, too. And you're saying, what are you talking about? All right, if I see a lady in line at Walmart and she has a neck brace on, I don't need three dreams and a vision to know that something's wrong with her. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? I see somebody... Uh, having trouble picking up their groceries and, and taking it out to the car. I can see they're bent over and they're hurting and whatever. You can look at people and see that there's something sad. I mean, Marty and I, one time when we lived in Reading, we lived in Reading for seven years, and we used to go to our mailbox every week, you know, there's a ministry was run out of Reading. And uh, there was a lady on the front steps talking to herself. We didn't need three dreams and a vision to know that something wasn't right here. So Marty and I prayed while we were inside the post office doing whatever. And when we went out, he says, you sit on one side of her and I'll sit on the other side of her. So we came out and just sat beside her right on one of the steps at the post office. Started a conversation. Found out that she's so lonely, so hurting, so oppressed that she has no one to talk to. And when people get really, really lonely and they haven't talked to another human being for months and years because their family has turned away from them, they have no one watching over them, nobody caring for them, they make up people and talk to people. 
we got to lead her to the Lord and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and find out where she lives so we could get somebody from the church to pick her up and start bringing her to things. Because God never meant for us to be alone. So what I'm saying, you can see things in the natural, but if you're going to activate the toolbox and the gifts and the anointing that's on you, you're going to have to step up and walk up to people. And, not, and so you have to get over the fear of what will they say? Who cares? Who cares? You know, when I had my own business in Pasco, Washington, for years, and when I first moved there, it was really kind of, kind of, I'm kind of dense a little bit. But anyway, that's a bad confession because I'm not anymore, but I was then. Okay, so I moved from California to Washington. And I remember hiring my secretary and, you know, there was already a franchise there and I just took over the franchise. And I remember coming into work and I had to tell the people, I don't know how to read. And so if you, if you want to keep your job, you have to read everything and you have to write for me because I can't spell and I can't read and all this stuff. That was before God taught me to read. Supernaturally, actually. And then, uh, so when I came into work one day, I said, they should dress different here in Washington State. And my secretary, Sandy, looks at me and says, what do you mean? I said, well, we don't dress like this in California. And he, she says, what are you talking about? I says, well, those ladies out there on the corner, they've got short shorts and high heels. And she says, Joan. I said, what? She said, those are prostitutes. They are? She says, yeah, and they get a little upset because I see you always talking to them every morning. I says, yeah, but I'm not trying to take over their job. I'm just talking to them about Jesus. So what I'm saying is, who are you trying to please? Okay, let me share this with you, because you're going to get this. So when I found out they were prostitutes, I would go out and talk to them even more. Then we have, it's my building. I own the building. Okay, I'm the boss. I wanted to be my own boss so I could do whatever I wanted to. People came into my building, didn't know if it was a business or a church. You can't sit on the toilet without five scriptures on how to get saved. <laughs> I mean, if I could, I would have wrote scriptures on the toilet paper. But anyway, what I'm saying is people would walk in and people would buy the spirit. This is what God wants. That's why I love what you did, Pastor. By the spirit, people would walk into our business and stand there for a while, like in a daze. And then all of a sudden, they'd say to my secretary, or my secretary would ring my office, that little buzzard, and I'd come in, another one's here. Because she wasn't saved. She got saved later. But buzzer, it's like, when these people would just wander in, she'd go, buzz, Joan. And I'd walk out and say, how can I help you? And they'd all of a sudden come to their senses and say, where am I? And I'd say, well, you're in, you're in our business. Is this a church? I said, well, it's not a church, but you can find the answer. And they would get saved. We had people drawn by the Spirit. Because that's what God wants. That's, that's where we're going. And that's the prayer you have to pray. That you have to be bold. So whether you see things in the Spirit realm... Or in the natural realm, you cannot, if you're going to be in the supernatural, you cannot be a people pleaser. So my secretary, after I found out they were prostitutes, I went, wonderful. So we have this big room about this size that was our break room for my employees. I had 14 people working for me. So I said, come on, girls, let's come in and have donuts and coffee. And they go, that's our break room. I said, yeah, but you're not on break. So when you're not on break, I said, I'm going to have them in for coffee and donuts. Well, then, then I was living, uh, I mean, our, our business was kind of in Scud Row anyway. So then one time I came in, a drunk was on the bench. So I woke him up. And I could tell he was, you know, he'd slept there all night. I said, come on. He said, I can hardly walk. I said, that's okay. I said, get up, stand up for a second. I said, just put your hand over me like this. And I said, come on, I'm walking you. Come on. And he's just dragging all over the place. And I take him down to the corner where the, there's a, a restaurant. And I take him in and put him on a bar stool. You can sit down now. And uh, pay the, tell the waitress and pay him. 
give him a track and stuff because he's maybe still too drunk to even. So anyway, people saw what I was doing, and so they called a grievance meeting. So all my managers and my secretaries called me a special meeting to let me know they don't appreciate. People saw you with some drunken guy walking down the street, and they see you hanging on the corner with prostitutes. And we're, we just knew you're our boss. And you know, they've done some really beautiful articles in the newspaper about how this business is good, and, and they're gonna get pictures of you doing this stuff, and it's gonna look really bad. And so what I'm saying to you is that it doesn't matter. And I said to them, you might be all upset with me, but my father in heaven is pleased with me. So I'd rather please him than you. And you know, one thing is when you're the boss, so if you're not happy with me, there are other places you can work. That settled it. Because I remember when I asked God for this business, I said, Lord, I want to have my own business so I can share Jesus anytime I want to without somebody handcuffing me. And I can take all the money I get and put it to this mission trip and that mission trip and that and send money off to missionaries. And God will do it. So what I'm saying to you is you need to get guts in you, which I'm sure you do, but you want those gifts to flow through you, right? It won't happen if you don't do something. It won't happen if you don't. So you're going to get things in the spirit realm or you're going to get things in the natural. So you see somebody with a back brace or, or somebody oppressed, somebody talking to themselves or whatever, then you just step out and do it. And as you step out, in faith, then the gifts start coming out of the toolbox. They don't, you don't need a toolbox if you're not making a cake. You don't need a toolbox if you're not fixing a car. So you don't need any tools that are just going to sit dormant inside you. And one day you're going to stand before God and he's going to say, what did you do with all the gifts I gave you? And I brought people in your face and I gave you opportunity, but you were too busy to hear. That's why you would pray in the Holy Spirit. To turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 10. Like a lot of scriptures. Matthew chapter 10. So who does God want to go and what does he want us to do? Chapter 10 verse 7. And as you go preaching, saying... The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. So God wants you to heal the sick. Cleanse the leopards. That's dirty, filthy sicknesses. Leprosy is a terrible disease. I had the opportunity to preach two, two weeks in the leper colony. Anyway, I don't have time to go into that story, but it's something else. So leprosy could be any disease, any sickness, but leprosy could be something that's crippling people. Drugs, alcohol, addictions, pornography. It's like a cancer that needs to be set free. It's something, raise the dead. So how many of you have cast, uh, been opportunity to raise the dead? The other day, a lady called me and she says, I'm on my way to the mortuary to praise somebody from the dead. So can you pray for me, Sister Joan? Because my friend called me and said, you've, you've had the opportunity of raising two people from the dead. I said, yes, I have. I said, he, she said, what was it like? I said, it was petrifying. <laughs> I was scared, scared, petrified scared. But God did it. And what's neat is when you're so full of the Holy Spirit, God does it in spite of you. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? You're saying, oh God, oh God, oh God. But then God just does it because when you learn to be... See, if you don't remember anything I say today, I want you to remember this. You can, there are people that are totally possessed of the devil, right? The de demonic man was totally oppressed of the devil. He broke chains. He cut himself. He got so bad that his family kicked him out, the business kicked him out, pretty soon the city kicked him out, and he was off 
in the mountains breaking chains and he was filled with legions and legions of demons that went into the swine. Well, God is saying to you and I, so people can be totally possessed like Hitler and the Antichrist will be totally possessed of the devil. After three and a half years, the devil will enter him and totally control him. And as far as that goes, some of our government right now is being, I mean, totally oppressed of the devil. Most of what you're seeing right now is a demonic influence. The devil knows his time is short. Even all this stuff with a What's going on with transgender and everything? It's just everything's increased, increased because the devil knows his time is short. So he's doing all he can to speed things up. But he, it don't matter because God has the final say and God's glory will cover this earth. And, and the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the just. So all these people are going to get saved and they, they give Soros, you can give me all your money and I can reap the whole world or the whole United States with your money. Instead of all this chaos and wickedness. And they're deliberately, Mar Marty told me today, they're deliberately saying where our judges, judges are so people can kill them. They're deliberately letting them know. It's wicked. But God's word says that when it gets dark, gross darkness, that God's glory is going to kick in because the church will say enough. And the real church will come out of the middle of the church. And there'll be this remnant of people that said, whatever I have to do, I'll do it. So you're going to raise the dead. You're going to cast out devils. You're going to go into the world and preach the gospel. And God never changed his mind from when Matthew wrote this and when Jesus said it. He didn't change his mind. And say, okay, it's been long enough now. You don't have to preach the gospel. No. You do not preach the gospel without the manifestations and operations of the Holy Ghost. If you're going to preach Jesus and the gospel, the true gospel, it should always have miracles following it. And, of course, the greatest miracle is when somebody gets saved. So go with me now in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1, Jesus is teaching his disciples a principle. Matthew, uh, Mark 1, verse 21. And they went to Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as, as one having authority and not as a scribe. First of all, you need to know who you are in Christ Jesus. I love the preaching of many of the men of God that have gone before us, but we now know who we are in Christ Jesus, that we have all power and all authority, and we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. And God wants us to not let that sit dormant, that, and that you could live your life, that every day of your life is supernatural, because you are not natural beings. Once you accepted Jesus Christ into your heart, you entered the kingdom of God. You are kingdom builders in the kingdom of God. And therefore, God is ordering our footsteps. And you have the Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us into all the miraculous. So that's what the world is crying out for. They are sick of dead churches and sick of stuff. They need to know where's the answer. Now, we haven't got there. Even Joan Pierce doesn't. I'm not there. None of us are there. When everybody in the service gets healed, and every demon in the service screams out of people, then we still have a long ways to go. Because we still don't know everything. People ask me, how does it operate? I said, I don't know. But I have learned one thing. You learn to hear God and be obedient. So then it says, so they uh, were astonished at his teaching. So you need to know who you are in Christ Jesus. Verse 23. And now there was a man there in the synagogue with an unclean spirit who cried out, saying, Let us alone. What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? We know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And the unclean uh, convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. You know, and they were all amazed 
and questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What doctrine is this? That he commands even unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout the region. Pastor, I just want to say this to you. The Holy Spirit just told me to tell you this. I just heard the little Holy Spirit talking to me. When you get into your new building, the drawing card for your building is signs, wonders, and miracles. And the word's going to get out that their answers can get answered there in that building. And waves and waves of glory are going to hit that building. I'm telling you, when I was in your building the other day, I sensed the presence of God very, very, very strong. So when you get in there, because uh, you're going the right way, but it's going to increase and it's going to increase. And you see, his fame spread throughout the region. So not just will they come from here in town, they'll start coming from all over the place. And they'll start coming because they heard about this church called Oasis where things are happening and they'll start coming from all over. And it's going to be word of mouth that they hear somebody calls over to Lewiston or calls over to Seattle and says, you got to come. These services are just awesome. So you be ready. You be ready. Okay. And that's a confirmation to what's already in your heart. And it's been prophesied over here already. Oh, so then it says, now when they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon, Andrew, James, and John. But Simon's wife's mother-in-law was sick of the fever, and they told him about it. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Immediately, the fever left her. Now, this is what I want you to see. At evening time... When the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city, wouldn't that be neat? The whole city, see, I'm just going to prophesy now. I know you're probably not going to want to hear this right now, but you're going to get it anyway. Your building's too small. All right. So, but you can put a big tent in the back field and just keep going until you get another building. Okay. All right. And if you don't have a tent, you just put chairs out there and go for it. I mean, pretty soon the, the, the government cannot tell us what to do. We're just going to do it, and that's all there is to it. And they're not going to know what to do with us because we're radical. Besides, they already think we're terrorists. <laughs> so, but, okay. So then it says, um, when evening came, they brought to him all that were sick of those who, uh, with demons were possessed, and the whole city came out, and they were healed. So what I'm saying is, God wants you and me to walk in the supernatural. Now I'm going to break it down a little smaller for you, okay? So let's just say you talk to a neighbor five houses down that has cancer and they get healed of cancer because you are led by the Holy Spirit and you operate in the gifts of the Spirit and you know who you are and the authority you have. And that neighbor gets saved now because they, they've been healed. They're going to open their mouth and tell everybody. So what's going to happen on your jobs or wherever you are, people are going to get to know that you as an individual, when you pray for people, answers come. So we're not talking about a church now. We're talking about each and every one of you in this building and those of you watching online right now, whenever this is seen, you can carry the anointing like Jesus. Last church I preached at, they said, oh, you, you were tutored by John G. Lake. Can, can you pray for us for John G. Lake's anointing? And I said, no, I can't. I said, how about I pray for Jesus' anointing? Why would you settle for a man's anointing? I mean, as great as I, I like John G. Lake and Wigglesworth and all of them, well, maybe God wants to do something different and even bigger. So the pastor, I think it was Wednesday night or whatever night it was, I said, okay, pastor, get up here. I said, I pray, because he didn't want me all week to pray for the John G. Lake's anointing, and I said, nope. I don't know how long he was on the floor, but anyway, he was there for quite a while. But that's what our heart should be. He says that we can do what he did. 
He wants you and I to be little Jesus. If we're not Jesus, we're little Jesuses, and we should do and be able to do everything Jesus did. And he's saying that we have to, and that's supernatural. And that's what the world's crying out for. And so, so all these people came out, fame started spreading all over the place. Now look at this. Go with me to Mark chapter 2. And again, he entered Capernaum, and after a few days, it was heard that he was in the house. So the word starts getting out. So what I'm saying is, the word's going to get out about Oasis, but the word's going to get out about you. So you might have people pounding on your door. You know, when I was on the Indian reservation with the Apache Indians, um, I, I'm not exactly sure what happened, but um, I was supposed to be praying all day for the tent meeting that we were doing at night. Instead, I got people knocking on the door all day. Can, can, can you pray for me? Can you pray for me? Can you? I mean, it was like services all day long. I, pastor said, well, I, don't, I can't stop them from coming. They know where you're at. So then I said, well, then let's go to some of them. I said, who's the worst person in the, on the village? They said, the witch doctor. I said, okay, let's go visit the witch doctor. And the pastor said, really? And I said, yeah, let's go. He said, okay. So we drove to where the witch doctors, two of them, live. And they had huge dogs. And I hate dogs. I mean, I love dogs. But I don't like dogs that bark. And I don't like huge dogs. I have a couple little little dogs. Okay. And actually... Anyway, so those are healing, and I'm spanking the dog. No, don't bite me. Okay, so I'm trying to teach that dog not to bite. But anyway, so these huge dogs are there. So I said, Pastor, you got to take control of the dogs. He said, well, how are we going to do that? I said, well, the Bible says we have authority over all things, so I guess we're going to have authority over these dogs. So we have to, like, let that dog know we're the alpha dog. No, you have to. And, but I was still a little nervous, so I just yelled from the window. And the dogs made so much noise that finally the people came out. Well, we have somebody here that wants to visit you. So they put the dogs somewhere, and uh, we got in the house. Now I'm in the house with the witch doctors. She's in a wheelchair. And so she didn't get saved right there, but I shared Jesus. And I said, do you want to get out of that wheelchair? She said, yes. Whose phone's ringing? Oh. So anyway, I said, you want to get out of that wheelchair? And she said, yes. And I said, great. Tonight's the last night of the tent meeting. You come, you'll be healed. Now, that's a pretty bold statement. And so I spend the rest of the day in prayer. Okay, I have authority, and I, oh Lord, you ha you're the one that told me to say that to her. I didn't say it on my own. You told me to say that to her, so you're up to something. She came to the tent meeting. She got healed miraculously, jumped out of that wheelchair, danced all over the tent. Then she got saved. Then she got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. So did her husband. That was the end of the witch doctor. But we have to have authority and know our authority and sometimes here, in this case, it said he's in a house, and the word got out. So that was, we had to go to somebody's house, and then the word gets out about these meetings, so you never know. Now listen to me very carefully. Pastor, I know you've got to take care of something, but I want you to hear this real quick, and then you can go out and take care of her. Um, there is going to be such a revival of people coming to Jesus that even though your tent, your house, your tent, church and tent will be over full it's still not enough every one of you are going to have people walking to your houses for small smaller meetings because they have to all be discipled the bigger meetings will get people saved but then they need to be discipled, discipled in smaller groups so all of a sudden when this great wave of revival hit every one of you are going to be exalted to be home church Wednesdays and Thursdays or whatever other nights, and then you all, your pastor will still be the pastor over all of you. But there's going to be so many people that don't know nothing, know nothing. 
and God will do a quick work and teach them so fast that they're immediately getting people saved. And they're so radical that you can't hardly control them and you don't want to control them. Just let the Holy Spirit do what he wants to do. And so what God's saying to you is that, so here's, here's this house is full of people and they gathered together so that there was no longer room for them near the door. And he preached the word, preached the word. He said, my gospel, he preached all over the world. And there came to him bringing a paralyzed who was carried by four. And they could not get near because of the crowds. So they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken through, they let the man on the bed, the paralyzed, lay, brought him in. Now, now, I know that there's been all kinds of teaching on this, but I want to bring a different point to this. When people get desperate, they'll do whatever they have to to get where they have to when they know there's miracles. Do you follow what I'm saying? So this, this family and these friends are desperate for their friend to be healed. And what does Jesus say? Go and sin no more. And the Pharisees go, what is he, who does he think he is? Nobody can forgive sons but God. But look what it says. Verse 9. So he, he knows what they're saying about this situation. And he says to the Pharisees, verse 9, What is easier to say to the paralyzed, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to give, forgive sins. I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go home. So I'm going to ask you a question. Which is easier for you to do? Get somebody saved? Or get somebody healed? Huh? So many people have no problem leading somebody to Jesus. It's just a natural thing you got so that you share the gospel. And then you say, let me have your hands and let's pray. And when you, if you repeat after me or pray this prayer, you're, you're saved, right? We, we all know how to do that. I teach that in the school of evangelism. But Jesus is saying it's not any harder to say to somebody in a wheelchair, get up, walk, than to say your sins are forgiven and have them come to Christ. The same Christ, right? The same cross, not a different cross, the same cross took care of our sins, our sickness, our disease, our poverty, our curses, demon, everything was done on one cross at one time, breaking all the strongholds of Satan and giving it all back to God. And he gives you and I, I give you the keys to the kingdom of God that whatsoever you bind on earth is bound and whatever you loose on earth is loose. We have in the scripture that said, ask, ask. And if you study the word ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be open. It means put a demand. It doesn't mean, oh, Lord, I wish you would please heal my sister. No, it doesn't say come to God wimping. It says know who you are. Pound. God. We have a situation, and I'm not going to stop pounding till you get give me what I'm asking for. Because you said that I should pound, so you start pounding on the door, on the heartbeat of God, and you say, "God, take me to another level. Take me to another level. Take all the junk out of me. Do what you have to. Cleanse me, Lord. Break me, Lord. Remake me, Lord. Whatever you have to do, and God will do it." And so He's saying, "Which is easier?" It's not any different. So you got to just step out, and, and it's just as easy to pray for the sick at the supermarket, the store, wherever you are. You know what? Nobody says you can't go to the hospital, right? I don't know how the hospitals are. I haven't been to a hospital in a while. But, you know, when I was preaching in a church, hold on. I was preaching in a church in Dallas, Texas, and this pastor... This pastor said, 
John, I really wanted to know how to do certain different types of outreach. I said, well, Pastor, um, you only had me here for three days. I can only do so much. And I said, you've had me take them door to door. You've had me go out on the streets, do street witnessing, and have done this, done that. I said, you know what? You've hardly given me time to even work on messages. He says, well, he said, I know we're flying out tomorrow, but you, you know, and I know you have to preach tonight. He said, but you have three hours right now. And I went, I just got through taking them on the streets. He said, well, you do have three hours. And I said, yeah, I do. He said, I, I want to learn how to do hospital ones. You told me we could do hospital. I said, okay, fine. I said, well, we're going to have to go because the hospital was quite a ways and traffic was really bad. I said, okay. He said, well, just teach me. That way I can teach everybody else. I said, okay, fine. I said, I tried to say to him, Pastor, it's not really any different. It's just you'd be led by the Holy Spirit a little different. That's it. It's not any different. Still using the same principles. So we go, we go to the hospital. And we're just going from room to room. We told them, we just came up with some name and said we wanted to visit them. And we don't even know who the person was. I don't even know if we ever got to that room. But anyway, they let us come in. It was visiting hours. So we went, uh, we went to, uh, I said, okay, this is how we do it. Lord, do you want us on the first floor? Do you want us on the second floor? What, where do you want us? The maternity ward? Where do you want us? Well, the Holy Spirit said, get on the second floor. It's okay. I said, then we get to the second floor. And he says, now what do you do? I said, now we pray. What room do you want us to go to? Well, in that case, we went to one room first and went up and started talking to the person and we're here to visit you. And but anyway, I don't remember everything we said, but then just wanted to make sure you, you know, that you're, we're going to pray for you to be healed. And he told us what his disease was, whatever we prayed for him. And then we asked him if he knew Jesus. Anyway, to make like a long story short, he got saved. And then I said, okay. I said, looked at my watch. I said, we have time for another one. It's amazing. So we prayed again and went to another one. And I, I'll, it was just really blew my mind. And started talking to this man that was in bed. And I just looked at him. And I said, excuse me, but I have to say something. The Holy Spirit just told me to tell you. Did you know you're supposed to be a pastor? And he started bawling. Oh. I said, you all right? He just saw it. I mean, really sobbing, bawling. He says, yes. God's been telling me that for quite a while. My wife knows it. I know it. And then I got sick. And I said, well, maybe you should have obeyed. And you wouldn't be here. Or something. I don't remember what I said. But anyway, he just bawled. He said, this is confirmation. I know that I'm going to leave. And I'm going to be healed. And then I prayed for him. For his healing. And anyway. So you, you, what I'm saying is, you want to be used of God? You don't have to wait for three dreams and a vision. There's nursing homes. And I'm sure you have a few nursing homes here, right? I'm sure there's hospitals in the area. If not, they go to the next town. And, you know, and, and even if you don't end up going to the hospital room, okay, there's people sitting in the lobby waiting. Because I know when my son got in an accident and he, we didn't know if he was going to live or die, the whole family was sitting in these huge waiting rooms with other families. So then I realized, hey, this is the best time to reach him. Are you waiting for somebody that's in surgery? Yes, they're usually all waiting for somebody in surgery. Or they're taking turns to go see somebody that's sick. Could I pray with you? And you just go from, you know, I don't hit everybody in that same waiting room. I usually the Holy Spirit will say this one and that family. Then I go to a different section on a different floor. And so what I'm saying is, you have the toolbox. You have the goods. You have the authority. And what is easier? To say your sins are forgiven? Or pray for the sick. And you can do both at these places where you go. Because God wants you to step out and walk in the supernatural. And you have to do it. You have to step up and just go. Because that's the next move of God. Everybody. It's not going to be a few. You know, don't get me wrong, please. But God doesn't have no superstars in God's kingdom. All right. So this next great move of God is not going to be done by Benny Hinn or... You know, this one, or that one, or this name, or this name. First of all, when we do tent meetings, I tell them it doesn't matter who is doing what. 
we do two different types of advertisement, because some of you get on my Facebook, right? Are any, of, any of you on my Facebook? Well, it don't matter if you are or not. But anyway, on my Facebook, you are. Okay, on my Facebook, I'm putting a picture of me so they see that it's me. But it, that's a different advertisement. We're saying, come be part of the tent meeting. Come help out. Help, come help and run the altars. Help us to go canvassing. That's to the church. But on the flyers that go out in the neighborhood, it doesn't have anybody's name. You know why? Because if you put on there Benny Hinn or whoever, I don't know who's out there, um, some big name. If you put on there John G. Lake or you put down some big name, like Mario. I'm not a Mario, but Mario says Mario. Because then what happens is when they know it's a particular super, 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 for lack of words, superstar in ministry, what are you going to get? You know, one tent meeting, they said, Sister Joan, you want to pack the tent out? I said, of course I do. Well, Phil Drisco said he would come and play for you. I said, really? So my friend was, knows Pastor Phil, Phil, well, Phil, Pastor, well, real well. And I, so I found out a contract, 2700 He gets all the offerings, and I went, forget it. Besides, this is what I said, the unsaved people don't know who in the world Phil Drisco is. So the tent is not to get the church to leave the church building and go under a tent. Because then you're defeating your purpose. Just have church. The tent is for the unsaved, the hurting, the backslidden, the sick, the lame, the mentally warped out ones. And boy, they do show up right in the middle of my message. Let me shut up. I don't want to hear what you have to say. Blah, 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 blah. And I said, okay. Oh, I'm going to prophesy over everybody. And I said, and so the team knows what to do. They take him off to the side because he's wasted drunk and minister to him. We don't hurt them. We don't make fun of them. I don't stand from the pulpit and say, somebody do something with that guy. We have trained people that know what they're supposed to do with that guy. In fact, one tent meeting, I'll never forget it. It was kind of crazy. But one tent meeting we had, this pastor called and said, um, you know, some people have told me about you, Sister Joan, and I'm going to come tonight. It's the last night of your tent meeting, and I'm going to see what you're like so I can decide if I want to have you come preach in my church. I said, okay, so you need a resume. But anyway, so he came. It was the last night of that tent meeting, and it was wild. I mean, that tent meeting was wild. By the last night, we used to run them, and we still should. We used to run them seven, eight days. So by the time he's gone seven, eight days, it's just totally wild, Holy Spirit. Well, we all got drunk that night. We were all so drunk that at the last of the meeting, I called all the pastors up to the front. There was about 15 pastors. We were all crawling around on the floor in the front of the tent. And you know those claws that you put on people? So we were all pretending like we were in tents, and we were crawling around, and we were acting like a bunch of absolute nuts because we were so wasted drunk. I mean, it just went on and on. Thank God that we were through praying for everybody. It was the end of the meeting, the last meeting of the night, offering, everything was done. People were, didn't leave because they just saw all their pastors just out there wasted. And so all I know is um, Marty came over, and I don't remember exactly how it all went, but I remember Marty said, somebody get her feet. And he had me under the arms, and they carried me. As Marty said, honey, he said, you were so drunk that you guys were going to wallow on the floor for the next rest of the night while the people were left. He said, I just said, I think I should just take my wife home now. And so he picked me up and he took me to the car and he put me in the car. And I'm like, and uh, this guy taps on the window and I roll down the window and he says, I'm like, hi, who are you? What do you want? He said, I'm the pastor that came to check you out. I said, oh, oh, oh wonderful. I don't know if he ever booked me. I can't remember, but I don't think so. But you move in the Holy Spirit the way God wants you to. Now, I want to sh show you something else that's very, very important. Turn with me to Ephesians 
So here's the key. Go with me to 10. I, I'm kind of kind of jump a little because I got more scriptures than time. Okay, but go with me to Mark 10. Now, you all know the story of the woman with the issue of blood, so I'm not going to turn there. But she pressed into Jesus. Okay, so there's, I'm talking about different ways of healing. Some people just press into Jesus and are going to get their healing in spite of you. Okay. And Jesus kind of wants to see their faith. And Jesus was in amazement of a centurion. He said, he said, I've not seen such great faith in all of Israel. Because he said, you don't even have to come pray for me. So sometimes you don't always have to lay hands on people. You can just pray for them. So there's different things. Don't get into like a formula rut. It's whatever the Holy Spirit wants. Do you follow what I'm saying? So here's blind Bartimaeus. And so your job, your job as ministers, because we're like ministry here. Okay, go with me to Mark. So the woman with the issue about it, pressed, pressed in, pressed in, pressed in. So I'm going to show you that why sometimes in services some get healed and some don't is because you don't know what's in the heart of a man and they press in in spite of you and they get healed because they're not touching you and you have nothing to do with it anyway. They touch in and touch Jesus. That's why I said you need to get people to touch the heart of Jesus. So here's Mark and it says in verse 40, 46. And they came to Jericho and as they went, a great multitude and blind Bartimaeus, son of Tamaris, set up the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus, see, now he wouldn't have gotten excited if he hadn't heard great testimonies. The more people hear about Jesus in your town, and you can't be quiet. You're not, under, you're not undercover agents. You're not undercover agents. Let's spy out the land. Yeah, well, you should do that too, and prayer. But you need to be vocal. If you're in a restaurant, we're all going to lunch today. Um, let me pray. Everybody in the restaurant will know who's praying. No pastor will let you pray. But don't be quiet. Don't like, okay, everybody, bow your hands. Father, people are listening. Let's be quiet. No. Now, don't be rude. Everybody in the whole, whole restaurant, you need to come to Jesus. No, don't do that either. But, you know, somebody at the next table might hear you. Just speak with a normal voice. But somewhere in your prayer where you're blessing the food, thank you, Jesus, that we're all saved. Pray that everybody gets saved. Pray for the cook. Pray for everybody in the restaurant. Lord, thank you for the food. But, and it doesn't have to be a long prayer, but you just put a little, you know, you just get so that you're, I'm a tool. I'm a tool. I'm a tool. I'm a tool for the Lord in his hands. So blind Bartimaeus, and it says, and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he cried out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And many wanted him to be quiet, but he cried out even louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And he called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer. Rise, he's calling you. So the disciples went and got him. Throwing aside his, his beggar, beggar robe, which is a whole other teaching, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, now watch this. What do you want me to do for you? Now, do you think that Jesus is not aware? Okay, look. Do you think Jesus doesn't know the man's blind? So what, why in the world would he say, what do you want from me? That's it. You need to get, when you're praying for people, sometimes the Lord will show you, this is why it's important to walk in the supernatural. The Holy Spirit will sometimes show you that, you know, before you, I can pray for you for your healing, the Holy Spirit's telling me there's some people that you haven't forgiven, some hurts that you have not let go of that are going to hinder your prayer and you receiving your miracle. So you could, let's deal with this first. You follow? Sometimes you've got to pray because they don't have very much faith. They're just kind of scared, timid. 
said, let me pray for your faith to be raised so that you'll have faith. And you might want to take a minute or two and talk about how great Jesus is and get them to focus on Jesus. So there's things that we can do in the natural through the Holy Spirit to get people so they're more like a sponge. Now, you can't heal them, but you can get them in the atmosphere of where they receive their healing. And the more you can get them to have faith, like when I was in the Philippines praying for a lady that was uh, crippled for six years. I was, I was a new Christian at that time. I was really nervous. So I, I, with my interpreter, scripture, 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 interpreter, scripture, all on healing, 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 faith, 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 healing, healing, because I was so afraid that I uh, needed to build her faith, but I was mostly building my faith. Does that make sense? And then I got to the scripture where it says, silver and gold, I have not such as I say in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And I remember as a fairly new Christian saying, oh, oh, Lord God, I know it's supposed to work. So, I mean, what was going on in my head? I was fighting the devil at the same time. I'm trying to do the work because the devil's going to try to get in there. And who do you think you are? Blah, 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 blah. I'm not doing it, Jesus says. You have to learn to take control of your mind because right while you're praying, the devil's like, nah, 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 nah. So, you take authority of that. And you pray. So then I got all the scriptures and I was like, okay, Lord. So the faith for a whole hour, people were like, is she ever going to pray for the lady? The whole hour. Just scripture, scripture. I'm building her faith and my faith. And then I said, such as, and I took her feet. She hadn't been, walked for eight years, six years or whatever it was. Put her feet on the edge so that blood could get in her feet. And I says, and I remember, <laughs> remember, like, when I took her hands, I closed my eyes. Oh, Lord Jesus, I hope this, I pray this works. <laughs> I know that sounds terrible, but the devil's just working overtime. And I was a fairly new Christian, and she, she got up and walked, and I was like, oh. <laughs> and she started walking all over, and people started screaming, and people started coming into this little grass hut. I mean, they were climbing in the windows, and, and we were like wall-to-wall -wall people in there, and this lady's, I'm walking her. First, she's kind of wobbly, and I'm holding on to her, and then she pretty soon walked on her own. And uh, the Holy Spirit said to me, don't just stand there. Look at all these people watching this miracle. Preach Jesus. Oh, oh, yes, that's a good opportunity to share Jesus. So, you know, because you have to do spiritual warfare, even while you're stepping out to pray for people. But when you do, the enemy leaves. As soon as you put action, action to the word of God, it's called faith. Without works, is dead. And without faith, it's impossible to please him, which is Jesus. So God wants us to step out and walk in that. So that's what happened. And he wanted him to confess it. So go with me because I've got several others, but I'm going to go jump to one that I want to do. Luke. Go with me to Luke. Luke, Luke, Luke. Where's Luke? Luke. Um, nope, that's not where I want. Okay, go with me to Luke 13. And I want to show something to you. Is that the right time? Is that 5 to 12? Oh, I got time. Okay, good. Watch this. This is very, very important. Luke chapter 13. We're going to start in verse 10. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity, inf say the word, infirmity, 18 years, and was bent over and could in no ways heal herself, lift herself, raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmities. And he laid hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the rulers of the synagogue answered with indignation and said to Jesus, Healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, they, 
there are six days in which you ought to work. Therefore, do be healed on those days and not on the Sabbath. So they're having a fit. And the Lord answered and said, You hypocrites, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox, donkey, from the stalls and take him away to water them? And verse 16, ought, So ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan, you see that word, be bound, Satan bound, think of, for these 18 years, be loosed from her infirmities on the Sabbath. Now, I want you to see something very important. In the last days, it says, there'll be lying signs and wonders, all right? I'm going to pick on somebody here. Um, you can come, come on up, but I'm going to pick on you because I'm getting to know you so I can pick on you. Okay, now I'm going to show you how a lying sign and wonder works. Okay, bend over. Okay, so let's just say, for, for, and I'm, I'm covering you with the blood of Jesus before I say this. I just want you to know what I'm doing. I'm covering you with the blood of Jesus. Okay, so there's a demon on her back. You follow? Okay, now there's not really, but there's a demon on her back. So this is part of Satan's team. So then a demon-possessed minister could show you a lying sign and wonder. And she's been over like this for 10, 15 years. In fact, I'll share a story that a lady that was 27 years like that. So she's been over like this for years, like this one, bound by Satan, 18 years, bent over. And no wise could stand up that Satan has bound. You follow? So if I was a lying sign and wonder, then I'm flowing as a demonic minister of Satan, but looking like I'm holier than thou, and I want all of you to give thousands of dollars after you see this miracle. You know, all they have to do is, because we're working together, Satan and the demon, watch this miracle. Be healed. The demon gets off. She stands up. Everybody applauds. And they go, oh, what a mighty man of God. So if you're waiting for your miracle, line up over here. Put $1,000 in my hand. You follow? Because there will be lying signs and wonders in the last days that will even try to get the elect. Okay. Now, thank you. Now, when you go to pray for people, okay, you need to have discernment to work in the supernatural. So, if you know how Jesus prayed for people that said, spirit of deafness, come out. He called a spirit to come out. He didn't pray for healing for that ear. You follow what I'm saying? So, you need to, let's say that a little a baby was born with the eardrum broke. That needs a healing. A child sticks a pencil down his ear and pops something. That needs a healing. But then there are spirits of deafness that just get in there. In fact, um, the Holy Spirit's just telling me. All right. Evidently, there's somebody here. And I'm not saying you have a demon. Okay. But how many of you here in this room, when you try to pray and have strong devotion time, your ears start ringing? The Lord told me there was somebody here. There's nothing wrong with your ear, just like my nose running. Mm -hmm. Come here. And it happens more often when you're trying to pray or serve God, right? You could be watching TV for long periods of time, and your ear is not going to bother you. But you start getting in the Word of God. See, so you have to discern, does he need a healing in his ear because he damaged his ear, was born deaf, or put something in his ear, or has an ear disease? Or is it a spirit? In your case, it's a spirit. You follow? Is there anyone else that has a problem with this, your ears bothering you when you go to be in the Word? Anybody else? Okay, behind him. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I command that spirit of deafness and uh, dis distraction. Go! Go! And I pray healing all through his body right now for the rest of his body and his hips and his legs 
and everything in him be healed right now. And I make notice to you, Satan, you cannot bother him and harass him when he's in the word or trying to pray. So I'm saying to you now, we have taken authority with that demon, but that demon will try to come back. So when you're praying and that ear starts doing that, you immediately tell that devil where to go, fly a kite and get gone. Just like for the rest of you, you won't fall asleep if you're watching a really good TV movie. But you start reading your Bible. You need to take authority of it because you're really not sleepy. It's the devil trying to keep you from the word. You take authority of it because see, if the devil can get us not in the word and not praying, he can weaken the church. The church is not going to be weak. They need to pray and be in the word and be a glorious church without spot, without wrinkles. So you need to, when you're praying for people, discern, is it a spirit that I need to take authority over? The Bible says uh, that every knee, every name, every name must bow its knee to the name of Jesus. Is that what it says? It says in Philippians that, that every name and every name must bow its knee to the name of Jesus. Cancer is a name. Tumor is a name. Diabetes is a name. Arthritis is a name. You follow? So you speak to it. Just like Jesus spoke to the fig tree. Our words, our life and death is in the power of the tongue. You can speak curses over people. You can also curse yourself. You see, one of the things that Jesus says he hates is he that causes discord amongst the brethren. You know, amazing. I'm very picky about who I have pray for me. I don't let everybody pray for me. I'm picky about who prays for me. Because some people just don't know how to pray. And some people use prayer. So in a prayer group, oh, Father, we pray, oh, God, we pray for the pastor because he's having an affair with the secretary. So, Lord, we just lift him up in prayer. Well, that's not a prayer. That's gossip. <laughs> Some people use prayer to just be manipulative. You know what the Bible says? We cover. If we love people, we don't expose people. If we know something like that. So we knew a pastor that was having an affair. The Holy Spirit showed me that. And so I said, honey, I have this feeling about this pastor and his wife. And he said, really? And he says, so what are we going to do about it? And I said, well, I don't know. And Marty says, well, why don't you call him and see if we can go, f go take him to that beach house for lunch in Florida. This really fancy restaurant. A little like, on the expensive side. but So we did. And they did. They offered, and said, okay. And then we went for a walk. And he says, you go that way on the beach with his wife, and I'll go that way with him. Well, that worked out good, except he never had me back in his church again because he says he's afraid I'll read his mail or something. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, but it saved their marriage. They're still married today. That was 15 years ago. So what I'm saying is, but you don't expose it. In one church I was doing in, uh, in a wash Oregon somewhere, the Lord showed me a lady in a prayer line that she was a witch. Well, I didn't, I didn't even deal with it. I said, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? He said, D do it after the service. Talk with the pastor. And then she can, you can take her off in a room and make her re renounce it and all that stuff. So I just kind of, the Holy Spirit showed me something. Another church, he showed me this little boy was being sexually abused. Boy, did I, I mean, talk about opening Pandora's box. So I whispered in his ear. I took my mic off and put it down here. That's what Cordis mic, and I put it down here. And I said in his ear, I said, you need to tell the pastor. Okay? I preached that, and the pastor called me a week later and said, Sister Joan, we need you to come back to our church as soon as possible. I said, why? He says, you, you told that little 13-year-old to, to, to tell me, and he did. I said, well, I didn't know. I mean, I knew he was being sodomized. Okay, that's what I knew. But I didn't know how bad it was. The youth pastor was sodomizing all the boys. 
and all the teenagers were sodomizing all the little boys that were five and six. The whole church was just, just a cesspool. And so they brought in the presbyters of the denomination, and they brought me in, and they said, we need you. They brought the presbyters in to straighten stuff up, and then pastors called me and said, can you come back in and do some miracle services for a week and bring healing to all the people in the church over this? Well, I said yes. And two of the ladies had nerve. I should have slapped them. That I'm a Christian and I'm not supposed to slap people. But, you know, when I came that week, they went and told the pastor the only reason that I detected that there was that activity going on is because I'm a lesbian. And that's why she could pick it up. I went, you wicked people. I said, pastor, it's a lie. He said, well, I didn't believe it. He said, they told me. And so then you had to like, Restore the people's faith in you. Not only restore the church, I had to restore the people. Anyway, some things like that happen. So I have a school, too. I have these other schools that I do. It's called the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> no, no. No, I actually have a school. It's a four- or five-day school. I say, so you want to be in ministry? Let me teach you the good, the bad, and the ugly. Because if you're going to go in ministry, you're going to get all of them. And how do you deal with it? So, so I'm just going to do this little thing for you, all of you. Okay? From my school, the good, the bad, and the ugly, okay? So I teach them. No, because this is important. You know, I wasn't planning on sharing this, but this is important for you to keep the anointing and walk the way God wants you to walk. I did a God's Taken a City in California. I'm sorry, I know you prayed for me, but I don't want my nose to run all over. Yeah, I know you will. And it did really good for a while. Okay, I think it's calling pollen in the air or something. So I did this God's Taken a City with uh, 40 pastors in California. And I, didn't, I lived in Kennewick at the time. So when I went down there to work with these ch churches for six months, they got me my own apartment and everything. Anyway, I worked with all these pastors doing all these outreaches. Things went haywire, and this went good, and that went good. And everything it was really actually good. But a few little things went crazy. And I was so happy to get out of California. I was like, wow. I mean, I had packed the car. I just kept a couple outfits in there because I needed my nightgown and the outfit for my Friday night service. And Saturday, I was going to boogie-woogie all the way back to Kennewick, Washington. And I got through with that service. I was so excited. In the morning, I get to leave. And the Holy Spirit says, you're not going anywhere. I said, I'm all packed. I've already told the pastor I'm leaving the key under the door when I leave. He says, you're going, but you're not going to Washington. And I said, but where am I going? Now, you know, I'm, I got dressy clothes and high heels. And the Lord says, you're going to go on a mountain and you're going to pray until I release you. I don't have any idea what to do. But I met this lady that lived in Santa Cruz. And then I heard the Holy Spirit say, I, I don't know, I'm not, you know, didn't live there. So call Karen. So I called Karen. I said, Karen, the Holy Spirit told me to call you. I'm all packed up, ready to go. She said, yeah, I, I know you're supposed to be headed back to Kennewick. And I said, no. I said, God told me to call you because the Lord told me I'm supposed to go on some mountain and fast. She says, oh, I know where it's at. It's right here in the Santa Cruz Mountains down the street from where I live. It's a young Cho mountain, and they have little cabins. You can't eat. You have to just bring distilled water and blah, blah, blah. I said, really? And she says, yes. I said, well, I need to do it. She said, well, come on up to my house, and we'll go down and see if we can get you a cabin. Well, I didn't have anything. She wore the same size shoes, so she got me tennis shoes to wear. I didn't have a mattress, so she put a mattress in her trunk and put it on the floor and blankets and pillows, and, and then I, I have no idea how long I'm going to be there. 21 days. The Holy Spirit said, I want you to pray in tongues five hours every day nonstop. Now, this is really important that you get this because I was, you know, upset with some pastors. So when I got upset with this pastor, I told this pastor that I was upset with this pastor and, and did some of that, you know, stuff that you shouldn't do. And uh, 
I got a hard heart because I wasn't being treated right. Rightfully so. Rightfully so. We did this huge crusade that we had planned, and everybody pla planned to do a play in one of the bigger churches. And the day before the play, he told me he wasn't going to let me use his church. And we'd already invited everybody. It was on the radio and on TV and everything. And people had practiced for six months, and they were handicapped kids that were the players in the, in the play. All the grandparents and everybody was invited. So anyway, God gave us uh, another church, so we had to have somebody out there with signs to go here. And uh, Anyway, it's enough to make you, like, <coughs> sick. But I was, like, copping an attitude. But God worked it all out in spite of us. So while I was there, fasting and praying, and praying, and praying, and praying, the Lord started showing me, you need to go, you can't leave even when you get through. You have to go say you're sorry to this pastor. You've got to go say that to this pastor. You've got to go take care of this. You've got to take care of that. You've got to take care of this. And this is, I'm not going to go into any more. I did what God said, 21 days. Because this is what I tell people in the school, the good, the bad, and the ugly. If you let a fence stay on you, you're done in ministry. You're just done. The anointing on you is going to go. I'm just telling you the truth. You have to keep a pure heart. A humble heart. Don't get puffed up thinking you're somebody. Don't be jealous of other ministers. And whatever you do, don't talk about other ministers or other people in the body of Christ because it'll kill the anointing on you and kill your ministry. So we have this saying. A duck has a skin, and you all know about ducks here and geese, has the skin that the water doesn't go through. So I tell people you have to be a, a duck. Quack, quack, quack. Anybody that's ever been to my school knows what this means. So if I'm saying something negative, somebody will go, it means shut up. <laughs> that means you have to know you're going to get hurt in ministry. But if you let that stick and not let it roll off you back, like the water rolling off a duck, you're done in ministry, and that anointing will get weaker and weaker and weaker until you wonder why nothing's happening. So I'm going to leave with you this. You want the anointing. You know your authority. You step out in faith. You know that God's going to be with you. And the last scripture was Mark 16, 15, is that they went. They preached everywhere. The Lord confirmed the word with the miracles. You are not the miracle worker. He is. You lift him up. Keep your heart right and keep your heart pure and step out and walk in the supernatural. God bless you all. Amen. What? I'm going to pray. Yes. I want to pray over all of you. Yes. And I want to pray back to like the first prayer I prayed. I don't have, do I have time to pray for everyone? There, nice prayer. Yes, and I got the prayer. No, 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 no. I know, but I have the right prayer. I just heard the Holy Spirit tell me the right prayer. All right? I just heard it real clear. Close your eyes, and you're going to repeat after me. Father in heaven. I have learned things this morning that I will walk out and fulfill and do, be a doer of what I've heard. So I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, lead me to people even this day where I discern how to pray for them, what to say to them, to pray spirits off of them, or healings on them, lead them to the Lord. I ask you, Holy Spirit, take me into a new realm of the supernatural. Because I believe with all my heart that the anointing's on all of us. And I'm anointed. And I'm a chosen vessel. You chose me. And you called me. 
and you've equipped me. May I always remember that I have a toolbox and that you will show me what tools for each situation. Send me out into the city, into the neighborhood, even today. Here am I, Lord. Send me in Jesus' name. God bless you all. Yes.